All right, let's go ahead and get started. I've uh, got some echo from Meet Echo, so please turn off your speakers, whoever's in the room. Welcome to the OHI uh, session here at IETF 119. This is the note well. Please note it and understand your obligations uh, that you undertake by participating in the IETF. A couple of tips uh, for folks. Uh, this is, as we have been doing a hybrid meeting, this is probably pretty familiar to folks, but you know, folks uh, here on site, make sure you scan the QR code, which I think is attached to the microphone or otherwise sign into Meetoco to make sure you're counted and we get an appropriately sized room next time. Um, remote participants, you know, uh, please mute unless you're speaking and uh, headsets is always recommended. We have, uh, Basically, uh, one current item and one potential new item on the agenda today. Is Tommy Pauly in the room yet? Uh, he might be lost. <laughs> is he navigationally challenged? <laughs> well, perhaps, yeah. Um, so yeah, we have we um, had an interim where we discussed uh, the chunk to HTTP draft. Um, and agreed that we were going to adopt that. Um, it is now draft IETF. Uh, so Tommy has uh, most of the agenda to talk about that. And then we have some time to talk about a proposed use case uh, for unreliable OHTTP uh, in support of private metrics. Ah, oh, there's Tommy. I'm sorry. <laughs> the IV room is really far. All right, so that's, that's the end of the agenda. Any agenda bashes uh, before we launch into it? Hearing none, Tommy, take us away. Okay. I'll get you, you slides. Yeah, I'll get your slides up. And just tell Thank me when you, you want uh, the next one. Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I had to run across the building. Okay. Um, so I'm Tommy Pauly from Apple, and I'll be talking about our chunked oblivious HTTP messages. <coughs> this is a document that I'm writing with. Martin Thompson, and we had an interim on recently, and since have adopted. So uh, what I'll quickly go through is the overview of what it is, and then ideally let's spend the majority of the time talking about uh, some of the open issues that we need to work out, what approach we want to take. All right, so next slide, please. All right, yeah, I'm going to skip this one. All right. Okay, so what is chunked OHTTP? Um, so uh, it's, just, it's a relatively small variant on the normal oblivious HTTP that allows, instead of having to decrypt and or encrypt and decrypt the entire response, the request and response in a single flow, it allows you to take separate chunks um, and encrypt and decrypt those pieces uh, without having the entire request and response all in one go. Uh, this has a couple of advantages. Uh, it allows us to use what binary HTTP already had uh, support for of indeterminate messages. Uh, we are reusing features of HPKE that already supported having multiple chunks with a counter. Um, and then overall, this is still, still OHTTP. It's still a single request response transaction. Next slide. Yeah, it's fine. It's a little slow. Okay. So this is the brief one slide overview of like, here's the actual content in the draft. Um, it's a pretty simple uh, format. 
uh, there's the existing uh, kind of like request header at the beginning of the OHTP flow. Um, that's just like, you know, here's the key ID I'm using. Here's the algorithm I'm using. Uh, but then instead of just being followed by on the request side, the HPKE encrypted chunk, uh, the entire thing now is prefixed by a length field um, and then a chunk and then further length fields until you get to a sentinel length value of zero, which denotes the final chunk followed by uh, the a chunk extending to the end of that stream. And then on the response side, similar to a normal OHTP, it begins with the nonce and then has various chunks. Uh, there is some uh, crypto work that you can see in here of how to handle the counter going into the AEAD encryption on the response side, but it's uh, relatively straightforward there. And so the properties of this that we get is uh, we are preventing a reordering of chunks. Uh, we're preventing truncation of the entire stream by removing chunks without the peer knowing. Um, so it really is just allowing you to process incrementally. Uh, in order to handle the fact that this is a different format, uh, it also defines new media types. So instead of message OHTP rec and res, it's just OHTP chunked rec and res. All right, so that's the technical bit, uh, relatively straightforward there. So let's get into the interesting stuff. Okay, so uh, we have an issue here. I think this is probably the most interesting to talk about. And this is something that when we were originally uh, discussing it, um, on the list a while ago, I think Mark Nottingham brought up uh, as a thing of like, how are you going to handle this? Um, so really, it's like, how how do we want to negotiate use? Do we need to negotiate use? Overall, uh, OHP is kind of interesting in how it handles negotiation. Um, it, it certainly allows for out of band um, very explicit configuration that's not necessarily uh, has to go through some standard mechanism. So some uses of OHTP, you just assume, yes, uh, a client learns about an oblivious HTTP key configuration somehow and knows that it should apply it somehow. Um, so for cases like that, um, one option for you know knowing that you should be using the chunked variant is to just say whatever other out of band mechanism you have that is what you use um, to essentially additionally pass along the information that you should be using chunked um, and i can say you know for the uses where uh, we in our stack um, speaking for apple like i've currently used ohdp a lot of it is like that um, so yeah, you know, we've been using it for things like a safe browsing lookups where we're trying to get a hash list of potentially malicious URLs inside the browser. Um, so in that case, we just currently get a configuration from like a cloud serve config bag, you know, a protobuf thing, and it can alongside it say, use the chunked variant for this, and all the clients would use that. Uh, that would work fine. Um, we also have APIs today where an app just says, I want to use this key configuration. You could very reasonably have an API where you say, use the chunked variant. Uh, Jonah, did you want to jump Are in? Are we taking questions here? No? We can. Uh, I really I can. Like um, um, I, I, yeah, go. Jana um, Ingar. So I don't have the context for this. I haven't read the issue yet. So apologies for that. But uh, this sounds like a general discovery problem. Mm. Why is this specific to chunked OHTP? Meaning, meaning that you could apply the same idea to any OHTP relay, it, it, for instance, right? It's true. So I think it's more like, how does this fit in? So, right. So today, like, yes, you could get your OHTP configuration out of band. Um, there is a definition. So, like this B option, like the the core document does specify, you know, here is the format of the OHTP key configuration, mm -hmm. and that has a media type. Um, and things like uh, we have our RFC on how to discover essentially through DNS that you set, that something supports OHTP that tells you, hey, you know, go to the gateway, do a get for the media type that is this key configuration, and that's how you fetch the key configuration for that gateway. 
um, so so there is like a standardized mechanism but if we are having that how do we fit in the fact that you would want to do chunked, chunked. Okay. into that is it a different media type for the key config is it some extension to the key config or is it, and then the other options here are it's not explicitly in the configuration and clients just use it but that seems a little risky for consistency purposes yeah i agree with that okay that makes sense thank yeah. you um, yeah so i think for like the cases where people are doing fully out of band you know it's up to the, the implementer to figure out what they want to do so probably the most interesting part here is you know if we have cases like the discovery from dns or any case where we are explicitly using the media type that was defined in the base draft how do we or do do we need to know along with that that this uh gateway resource supports chunk or that the relay supports chunk there's um a lot of things that need to be worked out if this is not something that is like a pre-arranged, pre-agreed setup. Martin, I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah. So Martin Thompson, uh, Richard mentioned options in the in the document. That would be essentially something in the form of the client just asks the gateway what it what it supports. Uh, there's there's mm. uh, client initiated content uh, encoding support in HTTP, which is a sort of client just tries, which is an, another option here as well. Uh, right. Which is I to say, to yeah. Um, and, and that's not necessarily a bad option in this case. I don't, I think the, the relay doesn't have to do anything special for this one, although I understand that some relays um, might um, based on what I've heard. Yes, I mean, so, but I mean, even, you know, even if a relay, would support it without any other configuration changes and we can talk about that separately um, it is a different media type that they pass along so if they have a very explicit allow list for known right. media types for a particular gateway they would need to at least have that within their allow list right but you would find out fairly quickly when that request was rejected with a 405 or is it 406 one of the two yeah. um so the just just trying is not a bad option uh, mm. for something like this for your discovery thing i suspect that most of your use cases for discovery won't care to use no this they, anyway. they wouldn't they wouldn't and so um it, lucas had an option d which was um dns uh, i might have an option e which is eh. yeah <laughs> I mean, I, personally, I kind of lean more towards the, you know, either you have something explicit or you just try it. Um, you know, what I was listing here is potentially one of the concerns with just trying it is the consistency thing of if, if for some reason you like, you let one client think that it supports chunked and like, or they say like, for this hour of the day, I'll allow it. And then I'm going to assume that people come back and try it. Like, I'm not sure if that really adds up. No, for, for something like this, where you have a, if, if you think that there's a clear need for something like this, yeah, then that need may have been anticipated by the server anyway. So yeah. you can just go ahead and give it a go. And if it doesn't work, okay. You put a little mark in the thing that says this particular endpoint doesn't, doesn't do chunking. We'll just send them all at once. That's fine. And you move on. So that may be, that may be what, yeah. we, what we can suggest here. And actually, I think one thing that makes me more comfortable with it is is the relay bit, because presumably in all of these cases, gateways and relays have some relationship. And if the gateway, you know, essentially says to the relay, like, hey, I, I support this media type, you should let this through, then that you imagine would be more consistent in letting that through for all clients. Um, and it's it's a bit indirect from what the gateway sees directly. John? Jana Ingar, first, I don't know if we can make that assumption broadly that the gateway and the relay have some sort of a relationship, right? Because mm -hmm. in this particular case, the relay doesn't have to do anything, really. The gateway could keep itself open to relays and could receive um, relayed OHTP mm -hmm. from any relay for that matter. So that's one, but hold on to that thought. The, the thing I'm not sure about is if an application needs chunked, and you try it and it doesn't work, what's the fallback for the client? Because if you don't have a fallback, then what's the point of just trying? 
I, mean, I think when we talk about these things in general, like oftentimes when you're using this, you have a very yeah, particular application you. where That's you know a priori what you want to use. I, I agree with that. <laughs> and I think I think maybe we should just say that. Like I, okay. I don't know That's that, fine. you know, trying trying anybody can try. You don't have to specify that. Yeah. People try all kinds of things and sometimes <laughs> they get, you know, they get they get identified as bots. But I'm just saying that, you know, uh, we don't have to specify trying. Yeah. If you're going to actually do something here, uh, it would be useful. The auto plan configuration thing, using DNS, whatever it is, is is probably more helpful in my opinion. Yeah. Um, that I think is useful, actually. Uh, to to the point of the relationship, and if you need a pre-existing relationship between the gateway and the relay, you're absolutely correct that the gateway does not need to know about every relay. However, the relay since the relay needs to have an explicit mapping between its path for the relay resource and the gateway resources entire URL, as well as allowing that particular media type, like you do need a relationship or at least a pre-configuration generally of the relay to know what gateways it allows talking to. Um, unless people have a fully open relay that has like a way to encode gateway URLs in the path or like in the query parameters. Is there anything in the protocol that uh, disallows that? Nothing disallows it. Right. I don't think anybody in their right mind would do it. Right. I haven't that. seen anyone. And do I, I'm, like I'm not doing it for sure, but I'm just yes. saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. No, no. I, I think, I, again, I think this is, it's useful to have the out of band configuration. I'm not sure that we need to actually talk mm -hmm. about just trying. Okay. Rich? Rich Sauls, Akamai. Um, are the OT, OHTTP keys always going to be the same as the chunked keys? I certain I, I mean, that's my mental model of it. So then certainly, you could but... ask for the chunk, and if you, what you got back was the non-chunk, then you know that the server doesn't do it. That, that would be in a case in which you had the key configuration, like have a different media type okay. or something, which is not the case in the draft. Yeah, right? All right. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's a direction to go, but then that potentially <clears throat> makes things more complicated, and more fragmented. Uh, Mark. Yeah, Mark Nottingham. Uh, I, I think, you know, part of what's happening here is, is that, uh, you know, there's not a particular, wow, Richard. Um, <laughs> oh, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Uh, uh, th there's not a particular, you know, protocol flow that you're starting, uh, trying to bootstrap where you would do this negotiation. Right. There's not a configuration file format that you're standardizing that would contain this information. You know, the uh, use of OHTTP so far is kind of ad hoc yes. and, and application specific. So it, 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 you know, talking about negotiation without that context doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. I think the most you want to provide is maybe some hooks or suggestions about how one might do it if one wants to. Mm -hmm. And that's why maybe the media type might might be enough plus whatever, you know. Doing it in the in the um keys, the media types doesn't really make sense to me because that seems yeah. like it's 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 it smells yeah. bad. It's like you're using some out of band information there yeah. that where it doesn't make sense. I agree. Uh, it's not about the payload you're using media type for something else. So I wouldn't do that. But I'd say, yeah, maybe just just have the separate media types for the actual payloads, and maybe you know suggest some patterns of use. Yes, I think that makes sense. Yeah. All right, so we've reached the end of the queue on that topic. I, I closed it to manage Great. time. Do you have, feel like you've got a direction forward? Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, we're not we're not doing anything explicit. I think we just want to describe, as you were saying, describe the the patterns of like this could be out of band. It most likely is. And here, like, you know, if you're, if you're trying because you think it's supported, here's the right approach to take. And if one day we want to approach like some automated OHTP setup configuration file format or something, yay. Sure. But that's work outside of this document. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good feedback. Um, yeah, so th this was a you know, comment on this issue, which is probably not applicable since we're not trying to put this into the key config that if we did that would be subject to consistency checks probably a good reason not to do that um i do think if we're having discussion in the document about approaches uh, we may want to point out that like uh, once you know that 
you, you as an application client want to use Chunk and you know that it's supported, you should be consistent in using it um, in order to not accidentally like reveal something about like, you don't want to like be saying like, oh, for this one request, I'll not chunk and the other ones I will, uh, that could leak information to the relay, et cetera, about the nature of your request. Okay, I think we can move on. Uh, I think the other interesting issue to discuss is around max chunk sizes. Uh, I think Martin, you had open this um so uh, yeah so this is like you know do we need to restrict anything here um i'm i would kind of lean towards no because the base ohp spec doesn't really have a max request or response size inherently on it um do people have reasons why they would like to have a max chunk size when they are doing chunking what? yeah so the reason I, I raised this issue is that the maximum chunk size is like two to the 62 bytes. And it turns out that it's if you're doing an AEAD and you have to hold two, two to the 62 bytes all at once uh, before you can release anything, that could, might be a little bit bad. Um, so, so having some sort of guidance uh, at, at a minimum would be, would be good. I, I tend to think that, um, specifying a maximum chunk size would be would be advisable rather than and just saying uh you cannot have a chunk size larger than a megabyte would be ah, i think so not not a negotiated field just not a negotiated field just a straight up if you want interoperability here's the number if you have out of band in, information that says otherwise you know, go for your life but um but uh if you want interoperability and you don't mm -hmm. know what the other side is willing to tolerate Here's the number, and we can we can argue about that number, but um, we can pick your favorite power of two, which is kind of like this last option. Five, here. Five's a power of two, is it? <laughs> ah, not an integer power of two, he says. <laughs> <laughs> it is an integer, so <laughs> and a power of two, so win. Five, it is. <laughs> hmm. Oops. Hello, Lucas Pardu, a co-author on the resumable uploads draft that just raised an issue on ourselves in the last couple of weeks where we were discussing upload chunk sizes. It's a ah. different interaction model, but sure. um, so that work is based on existing work of resumable uploads pre-standardization where some of those folks did benefit because the, the maximum thing you want to upload is potentially terabytes but uh, each proxy in the chain of the intermediation of HTTP in the world might have their own restrictions on per res like per chunk upload, even though it's not trans transfer. Um, so we have an issue there. I don't know, like we were suggesting some headers to kind of advertise these limits to help avoid having to hard code things and, and make it, it was a per resource limit as well, rather than a server limit so that uh, you could maybe have discretion between um, a free tier of an upload service versus people who might be willing to pay and have more things. So it, it feels like there's some overlaps and maybe some of the stuff that we're talking about in that group are relevant here, mm. or mm -hmm. maybe there's some text you're gonna put up that we would borrow back depending on how the discussion goes, but yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, well, I could totally see for that case having the per resource negotiation would make sense. I, for like the consistency and privacy reasons, I'm leery of that here. So we may come to different conclusions just because of but, but, the that, different nature of that would the be privacy totally boundary. Fine. But maybe yeah. if we put that in a header and we define the header yeah. that you could reuse here and you just always had the same value, maybe. Yeah. or. or and I'm worried that you know a header becomes an attractive thing to look like it's negotiation, and instead we may want. But we could, as you know, say like default values of recommended values are similar. <laughs> uh, I think like uh, if I'm using this, wanting to limit the uh, maximum amount of memory you have to commit um, to receiving a response is probably one of the stronger reasons to do it. So I do think it's important that we have a um, maximum. 
I don't really have strong thoughts on whether it needs to be negotiated. Um, but I feel like if we had a negotiation mechanism, the maximum size here is more important to negotiate than whether we're using it at all. Um, since the maximum size could theoretically or a lot more plausibly vary among different use cases. So I'm just going to speak from out here and next Nick here. For, for what it's worth, the, um, the way MLS addressed this yeah. is to actually just limit the size of the variance um, so, that, oh. so that values beyond uh, 2 to 32 are illegal. I mean, it's still pretty big. I mean, that might not be your favorite power of two, but I was like, well, it's, it's really two to the 30. Okay, so, so you just two, said two to the 30, I guess. The, the, the field itself could only be four by its long. Right. So the, the, the you actually, the it's not quite two to the, the 32 because you lose you have, a little you bit. You have the two top bits set. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, like, it's whatever that's, that is. That's, that's illegal. Interesting. I could copy that. I mean, it's a hack, but it's a, uh, yeah. I mean, if, 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 if if, if that's an acceptable power of two for you, then off you go. Jana Yengar, there's a, the problem with that is that you are actually limiting the use of this thing for larger. I mean, so he, he, the, what Martin was saying earlier, which I which I liked is that, you know, you should be able to, if you know better, then go ahead and configure it to be larger. The problem well, here is that you're actually parser. limiting it. Hmm? You just change your variant parser. Sorry, say that again? <laughs> you, you change, change, change your, your variant parser, parser to allow the big values. I'm, Change your variant parser. Oh, change your variant oh, to sure. allow the big values. Right. Yeah, but then, but then you lose that. Yeah, you mean you're essentially just saying like rather than choosing a max, a random maximum that doesn't line up with a variant overflow boundary, you may as well pick the one that's like, well, I also get to save space by default. It's, Is it? Are we actually talking about a maximum? <laughs> so, if if it's <laughs> if if we are saying, I want to understand the semantics of what this is. This question is, is it something that you want for interoperability or is it something that you're actually limiting the messages to be? Because if it is the latter, it's a max. If it's the other, it's really a min. If you want for interoperability, you have to support that size. Oh, I see. It's a min max. Basically, or something, but it's, it's not the max max. It's, it's the not max. the max max. It's the min max yeah. or the something. Uh, I think it should be clear about exactly what we're trying to do here with the max. If it's max, if you want to say max, then we should say max. And yes, your idea is good. But if you want the technology to be able to, if you want deployments to be able to support larger than that, which I believe is the case, then it's not a real max. It's a min max. Yeah. Rich. Yeah, Rich Sauls uh, As an operate gateway operator, uh, it'd be good to have a fixed upper limit just so we can do resource planning. Um, and whatever you do, don't encode it in the protocol. Because yeah. if it's in the document, then you can change it by issuing a BIS that says, oh, when we said one meg, we really meant four meg. Yeah. If you have to change the protocol, you'll never be able to fix it. Yep. OK. So we'll pick our favorite color. Just be like a hex color encoded as a number. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Are you? Are you yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yep. All right. So those those are I think the main things that need discussion. So we got good feedback there. Um, so I think we have enough to go ahead. Um, the other things that need to happen are adding a formal analysis. I was talking to Chris Wood. I believe he's going <gasps> to kick that off um, since we already had models for some of the other OHDP. We'll be adding test vectors to this. Always good to have. Um, and we definitely need to beef up some of the privacy and security considerations based on the discussions we've had at the interim, et cetera. I think that's that's it for this. That's the last slide, I believe. Yeah. yeah I think that is the last slide. That okay. is the last Thank slide. You. Thank you. All right, good. So we're making progress on that working group deliverable. Um, next presentation we have is uh, Lin Mao Song. Uh, Lin Mao, are you uh, able to do, yeah, come up on video and I'll pull up your slides. And Lin, Lin Mao, just let me oh, Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, Lin Mao Song, Echo here. Um, in this short presentation, um, I'm going to share 
for our use cases. Uh, let me know. We're, we're getting some background, a lot of feedback and background noise. Um, do you maybe have a headset you could use? Uh, oh, right. Uh, let me try. Hello, uh, I hope it's better. Yeah, that sounds a lot better. Thank you. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, hi, everyone. Um, in this short presentation, I'm going to share how our use case has been using OHTTP on our platform for uh, privacy enhancement and how the other uh, draft, which was previously discussed, um, the unreliable OHTTP extension might be able to help us further to enhance um, enhancing our uh, privacy protection. So, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I don't seem able to um, move the page forward. Oh, thank you. So, the main component of our um, system is shown up here. The uh, specifically, uh, the main component is on the right hand side, the DAG leader, and it is basically uh, an implementation of the distributed aggregation protocol. Uh, which is another IETF draft, um, draft standard. So for the sake of this presentation, uh, we uh, won't go into the um, DAP protocol details, but it should suffice to say that the leader ingests a huge amount of data from the uh, participating clients, which is shown on the left-hand side. And uh, the data contributed by the clients can be privacy sensitive. So for example, uh, they might be uh, measurements, and the machine learning gradients and so on. So to uh, safeguard the user privacy, we have a number of measures in place. For example, uh, differential privacy noises and uh, OHTTP is uh, one of these measures. And um, the way we use OHTTP is to basically force every payload from the client to go through the uh, OHTTP transportation. And in this way, we leverage the OHTTP to decouple the client's IP address from the target resource, uh, which is the DAP leader in this case. And, um, so, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, however, there are other things unmitigated, specifically the relative ordering and um, timing of the uploads remains a concern. So here on the diagram, I'm using different lines to represent a different client's upload. And one might be able to argue that for one specific client, uh, it's requests, its payloads are among a vast ocean of other OHTP requests. And so uh, might be masked among the crowd. And however, uh, if you look at the part between the gateway and the leader, the relative order and the timing of the requests are more or less um, still preserved. And so it can still be uh, inferred. So in theory, the information uh, may still enable a malicious observer or a malicious leader to craft a certain smart uh, correlation attacks. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what we um, have found, we seem to have found that the previously discussed uh, unreliable OHTTP extension might be able to help mitigate uh, this risk. Why? Uh, because as previously discussed, this extension would enable the relay to reshuffle and batch the requests and thus mitigating the um, aforementioned risks. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so um, um, here is um, our, uh, here are our, we would like the working group to, um, uh, to review, is, is this a reasonable use case? And also, is the unreliable OHTTP extension the right approach? Um, we are aware this extension was previously discussed and there were outstanding questions. So there were details to be ironed out. For example, um, if the accept header is the right way to signal the support and the other issues, for example, um, if the batch might um, uh, need to be inspected further to prevent a new attack surface and so on. And there are also uh, other more thought-provoking questions. For example, uh, if this should really be a more fundamental change to be discussed in the HTTP group. But it seems to be, it seems to be to us that the extension can be a promising solution for our program. And uh, we would really like to hear your opinions. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. All right, Ben Schwartz, please.
Hi. Uh, so it's been a while since I've thought about this, but my recollection is that this was uh, originally proposed in the context of DSS star. Sorry, I should say uh, Ben Schwartz, um, co-chair of, of PPM where DAP is, is being discussed. Um, so my recollection is that this came up in the context of DSS star, um, which, as I recall, had some particular uh, requirement essentially for a traffic anonymizer like Oblivious HTTP. And so it made sense there to strengthen the, the anonymity that that provides. But in the context of DAP, uh, you, you sort of, you mentioned some potential misbehaviors by the leader as the motivation for this, but DAP's threat model already includes misbehaviors by the leader and uh, if you believe DAP's threat model, the leader cannot accomplish any de-anonymization uh, because of the multi-party computation guarantees. So, uh, is there? Could you tell? Could you say more about the motivating attacks? Because, uh, from my perspective, DAP seems like a, a uniquely, uh, uniquely uninteresting use case for this architecture. Um, and I think this architecture is actually much more interesting in the context of essentially unsecured data submission. If you imagine that oblivious, HT, uh, oblivious HTTP is essentially the only protection in place and that you know, user reports are just being uh, digested verbatim on the other end. Thanks. Um, yeah, sure. So um, I, I guess the uh, original uh, the motivation is uh, probably less of the DAP leader. Uh, sorry, I, that might be, um, I, 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 mean, I misspoke. So they, I, I guess the, um, the main um, um, concern is really if somebody is um, like observing the traffic, then because of the relative ordering and the timing, then there might be some way to infer the membership um, attack and, and so on. So that was the... Um, the main motivation. So my understanding is is that this wouldn't help with that because you would still be able to infer. I, I sent somebody sent a report. It was aggregated into some batch by the um, by the unreliable uh, uh, OHTTP relay, and then that batch was passed up into DAP, which did its analysis. And so whether this is in place or not, the only thing I can infer is that this user appears to be a member of the batch that, from which we have this aggregate output. Um, uh, so, so my uh, understanding is that when doing the uh, batching, and you may not necessarily, for example, pack in the uh, same order, for, for, exa for example, the, there is also reshuffling. So that would further disrupt like the a limit or limit the capability of somebody maybe doing maliciously grouping the requests together, and um, so, uh, so I I I think I th I think the some of the details might still need to be uh, figured out, but the simple act of uh, grouping and uh, the shuffling and the batching it seems to be um, a potential way to admit to basically um, mitigate the ordering issue. Okay, well, so I, I guess I'll say I'm not convinced that there is an ordering issue. And I think if there is, it, it can probably be addressed within DAP internally. Um, but so it's not, I'm actually not opposed to, to this extension in general, but I'd like to see a, a more compelling use case. So I'm kind of split on this one, uh, unfortunately. Um, I, don't, I don't want us to be in a situation where we sort of submarine something in the, into HTTP um, without being deliberate about it. And it seems like from many perspectives, this is just using an existing status code in HTTP uh, and, and simply having a way to request that the, the thing that's serving the resource that you're talking to use that status rather than provide you with an, an immediate response, which uh, we could use things like prefer or something like that. There's a bunch of other mechanisms that we could use, but it doesn't really matter what the spelling of the mechanism is as much as 
what it is that's going on here. But if your if your semantic is we want store and forward for HTTP requests, that's kind of a new thing. And um, having the ability to do that um, creates interesting questions for what it is that is sitting on the other end of this architecture. And I want to make sure that we don't just stumble into that without having thought of the consequences of that. So having a discussion with the HTTP folks a little bit more would be a good thing. I see a number of them in the room, but um, maybe more formally asking questions of them to, to make them aware of it, because there are some implications, I think, for what this means for reliability and uh, server infrastructure to, to have clients ask the question and be answered in this way. Martin, hold on a second. I mean, uh, you say that you know this is store and forward uh, for HTTP. I mean, that that is it is true that the relay would be doing something different uh, than a you know, generic HTTP proxy, say. But that's already the case. Uh, it's already the case that the relay is doing special stuff because it's an HTTP relay. Um, could this not just be another bucket of special stuff that the that the relay does? Yeah, and that would be when if we build a mechanism, it's going to be somewhat generic in nature. That's the thing that concerns me there. Sorry, I'm I'm tying a string up here. So <laughs> please, ignore please the fact that I'm on the, the mic still. I'm done. <laughs> Make sure the knot is secure. Would you like a bowline or a? <laughs> Got a granny knot? Is that okay? <laughs> um, it just takes time. Got to do it right. All right. Anyone else have thoughts on, on this uh, on this draft? Anyone, else, anyone violently opposed to adopting this draft? Opposed at all? In favor? Mark Nottingham, you were making a gesture. You sh are you trying to in queue? This used to be easy I give you permission to approach the microphone. Mark Nottingham, yeah, I have not looked at this draft, um, and, and I admit that freely in front of everyone. Um, but uh, uh, listening to what Martin was saying, and from a very quick skim, yeah, I'd, I'd be very concerned if this was changing the footprint of, of HTTP unintentionally, and I think we need, do need to have that discussion. Um, that's always been a risk in Ojai, and it's been managed very well to date, um, and I think we need to continue to keep that in mind. Just very generally, every time you, you make a change to HTTP in, in a significant way, you have to think about how it interacts with all the different components and all the different functionalities in HTTP, and that can get quite complex. Tommy Polly, Apple. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with what Mark was saying. Um, but I think to the point on this slide, the the draft, which is long expired um, you know, is one particular way to try to express these things within HTTP that I don't think had a ton of review or consideration for these concerns in it. Um, I think the interesting question now is, you know, is this a problem really worth solving um, that, and you know, maybe to Ben's point, Maybe it's things other than DAP, but other cases where we have some sort of upload uh, that you know the, the client has no useful need to get an encrypted response from the gateway, and there are privacy benefits to having it be batched um, and potentially scrambled before it actually gets to the um, gateway. So is that a useful thing to solve? And then can we find, secondarily, can we find a way to write it in a way that either is only using existing semantics that aren't that isn't exposing something uh, as a new attractive nuisance within HTTP, or you know, can we very narrowly scope the semantics of what allows this such that you couldn't use it generically? Mm 
Yeah, I just want to point out that the definition of 202 more or less invites this interpretation. And so this is already something that I think might already be in, in HTTP, but it's not a very heavily used feature of the protocol. And it's quite possible that there are some, there are some gotchas that we're not aware of. And so having that discussion would be, would be uh, useful. Um, I, I think that there's, there's two well, modes. Sorry, to just to be clear, Martin, the 202, does, I mean, does 202 encompass the sort of batching scrambling? No, it doesn't talk about anything here? about that sort of thing. And I don't think we necessarily relying on that, on that capability here. We're just saying that if you're a relay and you receive a request with whatever indication that the client says it might prefer that you just deal with it and not return a response, um, sending a 202 in that situation and then dealing with that request and forwarding that request at your leisure is entirely something that's up to the implementation of that resource mm -hmm. and that would be fine. Um, however, making sure that we don't accidentally stumble into a trap that exists because 202 is not a very well used capability and feature in the, in the protocol is, is something that's worth spending some time on, I think. So, so let me ask the, the proponents here, Lynn, Lynn Mao, Tommy, um, to what degree is it important to, for the uh, client to get something from the server that assures the client that the server is going to do whatever, uh, you know, batching or scrambling or, or privacy enhancing actions, as opposed to simply getting a notion from the server that the, the response is, you know, request has been accepted and will be eventually delivered? I mean, my personal interpretation of this is that we don't need anything semantically from OHTP here that says, I am going to batch this at a 10 minute interval and scramble with this level, uh, you know, shuffle the deck this many times. Like, uh, you know, given what we were talking about earlier, all of this OHTP stuff already is very ad hoc in how it is configured. And we have explicit relationships and agreements. And so essentially it's like, we would just expect via some other out of band configuration that the relay knows that if it's being told to do this, it will shuffle in this way. And you don't need anything about semantics for that. Okay. It's part of that weird out of band OHP configuration, which is something that you don't have with a generic browser going to some HTTP resource. So that already is a big difference. Well, I, actually, that kind of raises the question, given, as Martin points out, 202 already exists. Could you just have a relay that, that supports could. this behavior just return 202 all the time? You could. Yeah, so you could say there's no way to ask for this. It's just like this is a relay that the relay would know that for this gateway, it always sends 202. Okay. So the case where you would need protocol is where the relay isn't always <sighs> doing it, only on request. Good point. Yeah, and maybe maybe that is a way uh, to make this uh, less of an attractive nuisance. Yeah, just just to clarify, I think there are two layers of questions here. One is, how do you uh, you know the relay itself is an HTTP resource, so how do you perform this protocol interaction mm -hmm. using HTTP with the relay? The other layer, and, and that's that's a question that can be answered, and it probably has to do with the definition of the resource, which means this document might have to update the original OI document because it's actually changing the semantics of an existing resource potentially. But that's a discussion to have. The other layer is the one I think Martin was referring to is, is that because this is a protocol built for applications that are expecting to be using HTTP, if you're changing the interaction patterns that are, are implied by that, you're changing the expectations there. And that's, I think, what needs more digging into. All right, uh, Lynn Mao, um, that, I hope, hope that was helpful feedback. Um, I don't think we have a clear next step here, um, except hopefully that was useful and you can evaluate where you'd like to go with this. Yeah, thank you. All right, thanks for the presentation. All right, that brings us to the end of our regularly scheduled programming. Um, does anyone have any other business for the working group? All right. Then uh, in that case, have a good evening. Um, have a good morning or afternoon or whatever time zone it is uh, where you are the remote folks. Talk to you all later.
My, the other question is like, what happens if the client just closes the connection after sending the request? Yeah, I know.